Hi there. Welcome back to the Mind Your Liberty podcast, where we're looking at liberty, what it is, why you should care about it, and how you can defend it. I enjoy studying the American Revolutionary and founding period probably more than any other. The founding generation in America possessed an uncommon grasp on the concept of liberty, and they wrote a lot. There's a lot to look at. But like I've said in the past, we shouldn't be content to just learn about a period of history from the textbooks and editorials. We've got to do responsible research and go to the source documents. And that's what we're doing here today on this episode. Uh, this piece is much shorter than the last one, though, don't worry. The actual reading will only take up about seven minutes of your time, and then we'll go back and touch some high points afterwards. Today, I'm going to introduce this piece in a little different way. I hope you'll enjoy it. Here it goes. For true patriots to be silent is dangerous. It's been almost two years since Samuel Adams wrote that. All his writing, railing, and rallying against the arbitrary revenue-raising Stamp Act had paid off. The Stamp Act had been repealed in March of 1767, almost one year to the day after its passage. Impressive, really, considering the two- or three-month delay for the news of its passage to even arrive in the colonies from the Atlantic and then the same time delay for the reports of unrest to return to His Majesty, King George III. It was a grand day, though, when we received the news of the repeal. Cannons firing, church bells ringing, fireworks going off all over town. It was a grand time. The trick of it was that that same day the Stamp Act was repealed, Parliament passed the Declaratory Act. A bit of a bait-and-switch, it turns out. The Act asserted that Parliament had full power and authority to bind the colonies and people of America in all cases whatsoever. Arbitrary power, that's what it is. Then, just last November, 1767, the Townshend duties went into effect. They figure they can get one over on us, forcing us to line their coffers with coin without us having any say in it. China, lead, paper, all now carry an import duty from Britain. And that ain't the half of it. The acts are intended to totally restructure our governance and tax collection here in the colonies. The way it's always been, our representatives and our local governing bodies both impose the taxes and pay the tax collectors. Even Sam Adams himself did a stint as a tax collector here in Boston. The way the Townshend Acts have it now, the custom officers are paid by the Crown, collecting revenues we had no say in. Well... We've got to speak up now. Today, February 11th, 1768, the Massachusetts House of Representatives is sending out an open letter drafted by Samuel Adams himself and James Otis to all our sister colonies and to His Royal Majesty. Hopefully, when His Majesty sees how the colonies are united in humble supplication for redress, he'll reconsider the issue. Massachusetts Circular Letter to the Colonial Legislatures February 11th, 1768. The House of Representatives of this province have taken into their serious consideration the great difficulties that must accrue to themselves and their constituents by the operation of several acts of Parliament imposing duties and taxes on the American colonies. As it is a subject in which every colony is deeply interested, they have no reason to doubt but your House is deeply impressed with its importance and that such constitutional measures will be come into as are proper. It seems to be necessary that all possible care should be taken that the representatives of the several assemblies, upon so delicate a point, should harmonize with each other. The House, therefore, hope that this letter will be candidly considered in no other light than as expressing a disposition freely to communicate their mind to a sister colony upon a common concern, in the same manner as they would be glad to receive the sentiments of your or any other house of assembly on the continent. The house have humbly represented to the ministry their own sentiments, that His Majesty's High Court of Parliament is the supreme legislative power over the whole empire, that in all free states the Constitution is fixed, and, as the supreme legislative derives its power and authority from the Constitution, it cannot overleap the bounds of it without destroying its own foundation, that the Constitution ascertains and limits both sovereignty and allegiance, and therefore His Majesty's American subjects, who acknowledge themselves bound by the ties of allegiance, 
have an equitable claim to the full enjoyment of the fundamental rules of the British Constitution, that it is an essential, unalterable right in nature, engrafted into the British Constitution as a fundamental law, and ever held sacred and irrevocable by the subjects within the realm, that what a man has honestly acquired is absolutely his own, which he may freely give, but cannot be taken from him without his consent, that the American subjects may, therefore, exclusive of any consideration of charter rights, with a decent firmness adapted to the character of free men and subjects, assert this natural and constitutional right. It is, moreover, their humble opinion, which they express with the greatest deference to the wisdom of the Parliament, that the acts made there, imposing duties on the people of this province, with the sole and express purpose of raising a revenue, are infringements of their natural and constitutional rights, because, as they are not represented in the British Parliament, His Majesty's Commons in Britain, by those acts, grant their property without their consent. This house further are of an opinion that their constituents, considering their local circumstances, cannot by any possibility be represented in the Parliament, and that it will forever be impracticable that they should be equally represented there, and consequently not at all, being separated by an ocean of a thousand leagues. That His Majesty's royal predecessors, for this reason, were graciously pleased to form a subordinate legislature here, that their subjects might enjoy the unalienable right of a representation. Also, that considering the utter impracticability of their ever being fully and equally represented in Parliament, and the great expense that must unavoidably attend even a partial representation there, this House think that a taxation of their constituents, even without their consent, grievous as it is, would be preferable to any representation that could be admitted for them there. Upon these principles, and also considering that were the right in Parliament ever so clear, yet, for obvious reasons, it would be beyond the rules of equity that their constituents should be taxed on the manufactures of Great Britain here, in addition to the duties they pay for them in England, and other advantages arising to Great Britain from the acts of trade, this House have preferred a humble, dutiful, and loyal petition to our most gracious Sovereign, and made such representations to His Majesty's ministers as they apprehended would tend to obtain redress. They have also submitted to consideration whether any people can be said to enjoy any degree of freedom if the crown, in addition to its undoubted authority of constituting a governor, should appoint him such a stipend as it may judge proper without the consent of the people and at their expense, and whether, while the judges of the land and other civil officers hold not their commissions during good behavior, their having salaries appointed for them by the crown, independent of the people, hath not a tendency to subvert the principles of equity, and endanger the happiness and security of the subject. In addition to these measures, the House have written a letter to their agent which he is directed to lay before the ministry, wherein they take notice of the hardships of the Act for preventing mutiny and desertion, which requires the governor and council to provide enumerated articles for the king's marching troops, and the people to pay the expenses, and also the commission of the gentlemen appointed commissioners of the customs to reside in America, which authorizes them to make as many appointments as they think fit, and to pay the appointees what sum they please, for whose malconduct they are not accountable, from whence it may happen that the officers of the crown may be multiplied to such a degree as to become dangerous to the liberty of the people, by virtue of a commission, which does not appear to this house to derive any such advantages to trade as many have supposed. These are the sentiments and proceedings of this house, and as they have too much reason to believe that the enemies of the colonies have represented them to His Majesty's ministers, and to the Parliament, as factious, disloyal, and having a disposition to make themselves independent of the mother country, they have taken occasion, in the most humble terms, to assure His Majesty and His ministers that, with regard to the people of this province, and, as they doubt not, of all the colonies, the charge is unjust. The House is fully satisfied that your assembly is too generous and liberal in sentiment to believe that this letter proceeds from an ambition of taking the lead, or dictating to the other assemblies. They freely submit their opinions to the judgment of others, 
and shall take it kind in your house to point out to them anything further that may be thought necessary. This house cannot conclude without expressing their firm confidence in the king, our common head and father, that the united and dutiful supplications of his distressed American subjects will meet with his royal and favorable acceptance. Okay, so there you have it. You just listened to a source document. You did your responsible research. Now, let's go back over and hit a few of the high points. In the second paragraph there, they express their desire for the colonies to, quote, harmonize with each other and freely to communicate. They were starting a conversation. Tyranny can't stand free speech. The then as now famous Ben Franklin, writing years earlier in the newspaper article as Silence Do Good, said, In those wretched countries where a man cannot call his tongue his own, he can scarce call anything his own. Whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech, a thing terrible to public traitors. Free speech, free thought, property rights, religious freedom, they're all linked. Today we see free speech being limited and censored online. However, I still believe we live in the most free country on earth. But don't censor yourself, or they've won. The left's tactics of demonizing and name-calling are effective and brutal tactics, but they only work if we let them. Dare to be courageous. Dare to speak the truth in love. Later on down there in the second paragraph, we see the quote, In all free states the Constitution is fixed. This is why the view of the Constitution as a living document is so fatal. Keep in mind, they didn't have a written Constitution then. The British Constitution wasn't written down, but they viewed it as fixed. Today, we have a written constitution, but we've had a largely uneducated populace that hasn't stood up on the encroachment of liberty. President Woodrow Wilson nominated Supreme Court justices that viewed the constitution as a living document for the first time. But it's not a living document. No. We've got to take the meaning of the Constitution as it was understood by the people that ratified it. For more on this, check out the Tenth Amendment Center episode I linked in the description down below, How to Read an 18th Century Legal Document. They break that down way better than I ever could. And then further on down in the same sentence speaking about the Constitution, they assert that Parliament, quote, cannot overleap the bounds of it without destroying its own foundation. You see, the Constitution is what made Parliament. That's why Parliament was there, is because the Constitution set it up that way. So, when authority is usurped that isn't delegated in the Constitution today, which is pretty much everything the federal government does, they are the rebels. They're the ones breaking the law, as the Constitution is a law. The people who claim and exercise their rights are not the rebels. The people gave the authority to the Constitution, and thereby to the government. When the government overleaps its bounds as set forth in the Constitution, it destroys its own foundation. All right, and then farther on down in that same paragraph, they assert that the Constitution ascertains and limits both sovereignty and allegiance. I'll throw in a quote from James Otis Jr., same time period, an act against the Constitution is void. That means it's of no effect. It's nothing ascertains sovereignty and allegiance. It's a two-way street. Government stays in its lanes. We're loyal. Government usurps authority not granted to it. The people should resist. They're duty-bound. Thomas Jefferson said later, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as the gifts of their chief magistrate. So they're gently, humbly trying to remind Parliament that they're not the ones breaking the rules here, and they're kind of asking Parliament, in a way, to kind of stay in their lane. Later on down, again, in that same paragraph, they assert that, quote, what a man has honestly acquired is absolutely his own, which he may freely give, but cannot be taken from him without his consent. Notice that before it, it said it's an unalterable right in nature that was engrafted into the Constitution. Natural rights are God-given, and they predate or rise above the Constitution. We've got to stop referring to our rights as First Amendment rights or Second Amendment rights. They're natural rights. The document, the Constitution, just tells government to keep their mitts off of it. Even had the document not been written, we would still have our rights. 
But then, and as now, we only have what we claim, or what we, quote, assert, as the letter, letter here states, that the American subjects may, therefore, exclusive of any consideration of charter rights, with a decent firmness, adapted to the character of free men and subjects, assert this natural and constitutional right. Also, returning to that sentence, what a man hath honestly acquired is his own and cannot be taken from him without his consent, I'll just take this juncture to point out that uh, Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto summed up his view of communism as the abolition of private property. So, communism is diametrically opposed to the principles of liberty. All right, getting back to it, in this next paragraph down, they said that by restructuring the tax structure and government structure there in the colonies under the Townshend Acts, they had uh, granted their property without their consent. Now, taxation without representation, as we hear today, was a phrase that was coined around this time. However, in the next phrase, we see they couldn't be properly represented in Parliament due to distance. They had no idea what the local circumstances were in the colonies when they are sitting in Great Britain. That's why the Crown had originally set up local governance in the original charters. Taxation without representation, grievous as it is, would be preferable to any representation that could be admitted for them there, they said. This principle is still worth keeping in mind today. We can't expect Washington, D.C. to fix our problems here where, right where we live, locally. We should be smart enough to know that they can't. The general, or federal government as we commonly refer to it nowadays, was never intended to micromanage the society or the economy. During ratification of the Constitution, people were alarmed at the proposal ratio of one representative for every 30,000 people. That's actually in the Constitution. Again, arguing that with that ratio, there cannot be true representation. Keep in mind today, each representative in the lower house in D.C. represents an average of 747,000 people. Now you tell me how much representation there is. That's why... The state governments are so important. The federal system was genius. The founders, they argued back and forth in the ratification debates, and they came up with a genius system. Now, obviously, we've fallen a long way, but just look at the coronavirus pandemic. Look at the response of the United States. Okay, look at the, the there's free states. Look at Florida, Texas, somewhat Missouri. The federal system is a win, just like that's a microcosm of it. Even as far as we've fallen, the federal system is a win. The local governance is incredibly important, and we're seeing a groundswell of grassroots people taking back their state houses, their state senates, and calling them and flooding them with emails. All that's extremely important. The states is where it's at because, as the Tenth Amendment said, everything that's not delegated to the federal government in the Constitution is retained to the states or the people thereof. All right, back back to the next next paragraph, uh, sixth paragraph, it's also worth revisiting. They questioned, quote, whether any people can be said to enjoy any degree of freedom if the crown, in addition to its undoubted authority of constituting a governor, should appoint him such a stipend as it may judge proper without the consent of the people and at their expense. Again, this came up later in the ratification debates. Folks were wary of this national plan where the representatives were to be paid out of the national treasury instead of by their respective states and localities because they understood that there is an allegiance to the hand that feeds. I think it's also worth mentioning here that the Baptists were fighting their very own battle with this mentality right in Massachusetts Colony. On May 25, 1768, a Baptist church from Ashfield brought the following petition to the General Assembly at Boston. The same assembly, keep in mind, that had sent out the Massachusetts Circular Letter on February 11th of the same year. Quote, We are brought under distressful circumstances, which we think cry aloud for some pity to be shown on our ability, and have yearly our money taken away from us, and our land sold at an outcry to support their worship. We pray, therefore, free us and our lands from paying any more towards the maintenance of the minister, or finishing the meeting house, of a society we do not belong to, we being willing to pay our province tax and all others except the above mentioned. So they were 
the Baptists were being forced to pay for the congregational church house. They were being taxed by the state to pay for the congregational or state church at that time in Massachusetts to build a new church house. And this is way out in western Massachusetts, but they had sent this petition to this Massachusetts uh, legislature. And the assembly then enacted, in retaliation it seems, an even more oppressive tax schedule just for them seeking redress. Right after this new tax law was passed, the governor dissolved the assembly. I just thought I'd mention that in passing. We'll get back to the letter now. They went on in their question uh, whether, while the judges of the land or other civil officers hold not their commissions during good behavior, they're having salaries appointed to them by the crown, independent of the people, hath not a tendency to subvert the principles of equity and endanger the happiness and security of the subject? This just makes me think of the bloated, unelected bureaucracy we live under today. The highest paid person in the government, supposedly, is the current chief medical advisor to the President of the United States. All right, might be getting a little off track here. We'll get back to the letter again. In the next paragraph, they make one more point about standing armies being dangerous to liberty, which again was not a novel concept. Rather, it was something that was, as my grandpa would say, intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. All right. In the second to last paragraph, they express reassurance that they do not want independence from Great Britain. They were simply seeking redress, again, for grievances, something all British subjects have a right to do. Also, they maintained that the open part of this open letter was merely in the spirit of free discourse. They finish up the last paragraph with a lavish language, This house cannot conclude without expressing their firm confidence in the king, our common head and father, that the united and dutiful supplications of his distressed American subjects will meet with his royal and favorable acceptance. Well, as it turns out, the letter did not meet with favorable acceptance. The letter was taken to be in blatant disregard to Section 2 of the Declaratory Act that indicated even questioning the authority of the Parliament was prohibited. The Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Hillsborough, sensing the galvanizing effect the open letter had on the colonies, and doubtless predicting the Crown's displeasure, ordered the Massachusetts House of Representatives to revoke it. I have a hard time saying Massachusetts. Massachusetts. They convened to vote on the issue, with the door barred, incidentally, and on June 30th, 1768, they voted 92 to 17 not to rescind the letter. There was another celebration in Boston after that, and Paul Revere engraved a custom silver bull just for the occasion. In retaliation, however, Governor Bernard dissolved the assembly, which then proceeded to meet anyway as needed. The letter, though they said was not written from an ambition of taking the lead, nonetheless kind of accomplished just that. Virginia, New Jersey, and Connecticut all sent official letters of affirmation back. All the colonies, to my knowledge, were impacted by the letter and its assertions. Even John Witherspoon, whose famous sermon we read just last episode, he had no doubt read the letter shortly after arriving in America in August of 1768. Eventually, the colonies had banded together to boycott all but the most necessary British imports. This and other acts perceived as tending towards a spirit of independence were met with a heavy hand. In October 1768, 2,000 British troops were installed to occupy the town of Boston. New York also experienced an occupation during the same time. The troops were to be quartered among them due to the Quartering Act you may have heard of. One thing led to another, and we'll have to leave off the history right here for now. So that wraps it up for today's episode. I sure did enjoy putting this together. Seriously, I this has forced me to nail down the timelines and the relation of the events together in my own mind more than ever, because... I listen to a lot of stuff and I kind of piecemeal stuff together, but putting it all down on an episode and of course writing it down in a kind of a, in a, a script and then recording it, it really forces me to, to nail the things down and I'm learning so much doing this. And I love it. I've got like three, well, I got three books in front of me right now in a Chrome browser with 20 tabs open right now. And, uh, so I, I'm going to put some links in the time in the, uh, Description down below. Be sure and check those out. And because I'm just starting out in this, not a whole lot of people are benefiting right now. So 
because it's such a small audience. But if you liked it, if you benefited from it, please share it with somebody. Share it on social media. Share it via word of mouth. However, help us grow the channel. Man, I'd sure appreciate it. Uh, I got a book recommendation. I'm going to try and always recommend some sort of a resource, whether it be a book or, or what have you, on every episode. Because I'm... There's no way I could cover everything that needs to be covered. So I'm going to recommend a book I relied on heavily for this episode that really put a timeline together for me uh, recently. I just finished it. Uh, it's Iris Stoll's biography of Sam Adams. It's called Sam Adams, a, or excuse me, Samuel Adams, A Life. And I, again, I link to that down below. And then uh, also... I actually listened to the book. I have a hard copy. I bought a hard copy, but I actually listened to the book. And I want to do a shout out right now for your local library. Huge resource. Uh, you see on TV, radio, Pandora, Audible is advertising like crazy. And Audible is cool, aside from being associated with Amazon, but it, uh, it costs money. Your library is free. Well, it's not free, but it's free to you you just go get a library card. And Hoopla is an app that you can download on your phone. There's also the Libby app. There's also the Access 360 app. Check it out. Get in contact with your local library. You get a local library card. You get the app. You punch in your library card and you have access to thousands of audiobooks, especially if you got a good library. Our library is here kind of fair. I'm waiting to get a, a bigger library card. But it's great because you can listen for free. You just check it out. Some of the apps, you are you have to place holds just like you do on the other in a real library. But Hoopla, it's a, what's called an instant borrow. And you just borrow it and it gets returned when you're done listening to it. And it's free. And there's lots and lots of audiobooks on there in addition to ebooks, which I'm not too into. But check it out. Big shout out for that. And then also the Tenth Amendment Center. I cannot give enough plugs for the Tenth Amendment Center. They really have changed my life, honestly. Check it out, 10 amendmentcentercom And uh, they got a podcast, The uh, Path to Liberty. It's actually a live show done by Michael Bolden. Check it out. They do way more. It's a full-time job for him than I could ever do. And so I feel it's my responsibility to tell you to go check them out. But don't leave me. And then uh, remember to like and subscribe, whatever platform you're listening to. Thanks again for joining me here. Really appreciate your time. And remember to mind your liberty.